for investors, which has been really fun. That's also been in the alt protein space. And very recently, I was onboarded as the scientist in residence with Counterfactual Ventures. So we're aiming to build the next generation of alt protein companies, which is very exciting. Great. Thank you for checking once again. You can hear me now. Similar issues, Agnieszka. Right. I'll try to dial in. Do you want to connect on your phone potentially? Yeah. Uh, Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? And so, uh. Hey everyone, uh, great to be here and uh, thanks for Jessup for uh, inviting me uh, over. Uh, I'm Tom, a senior scientist at uh, GFI Israel, uh, focused on uh, cultivated meat. Uh, my background is also from uh, cultivated meat. Uh, I did my PhD. Uh, on a uh, co-culture of uh, bovine uh, cells or uh, on a uh, TVP on a plant protein-based uh, scaffold from this uh, research from the, the company Ale Farms. And we also were able to, uh, really happy to say we were able to uh, publish it as well in uh, Nature Food. And uh, now as a senior scientist at GFI, I did counseling for uh, companies, uh, researchers, students, uh, investors and so on. We also give lectures and we have uh, three uh, courses in Israel about, we are giving three courses in uh, Israel, in universities in Israel on uh, cultivated meat and plant-based meat in Tel Aviv University, in uh, Ben Gurion University and uh, Hebrew University. We are also supporting a course in uh, the Technion also on alternative protein, the science behind the uh, meat substitutes. So uh, really exciting, uh, at least for me, it's really exciting. And if anyone wants us to give those courses uh, abroad, then uh, we'll be happy to try and help uh, getting them uh, as well. Very good. Let's see if uh, Neska maybe now works. If not, what I, I can start myself maybe with the, what would be my... Um, <laughs> my thesis or my idea for the next uh, what will happen next in the plant-based meat uh, space in terms of uh, scientific advances maybe Anessa can try um, if not I will take it yeah I see she's reconnecting so I suppose she's reconnecting with the phone uh, Ryan, I, think look... I think she's actually connected on her phone just needs to unmute herself Maybe not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think you can continue, I guess, like the discussions that you were having earlier. Um, Hello, can you hear oh, me? Oh, hey. Oh, perfect. Okay. Really, really sorry about this. It's, um, everything was going so well in the green room. Uh, so, uh, so I missed the introductions uh, from you guys, but um, I, 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 I do know your background. Um, and um and i'm just just first of all say pleasure to be with you uh this is very exciting technology and science is uh the backbone of alternative protein industry so i wanted to ask each of you um a question or two and i start with giuseppe uh, and you know why don't i start with a big one um and and let, let's talk about the future um and you know, you spent the past few years developing um, a plant-based steak. Um, obviously, in the space, we've seen a lot of focus on burgers. We have burgers, we have um, sausages, even some chicken nuggets. And so, so I was just wondering, well, how do you see the development of the alternative protein industry um, going forward? What, what sort of products are we going to be eating in the next few years? Thanks, Anjeska. Yeah, we, we hear you perfectly fine now, so thank you. Um, I think uh, um, it's very interesting um, for uh, my, my viewpoint, I think that the alternative meat industry will, uh, will be very different from what we see right now in the supermarkets and in the restaurants. And uh, in summary, I think that uh, we are moving beyond the burgers, beyond the meatballs, beyond the sausages, uh, towards a, varied, um, a variety of alternative meats. So what uh, I believe is that, uh, as, well, as with uh, our work at Novamit, working on uh, whole muscle cuts, for example, uh, this, there will be a variety of uh, different types of meat, seafood, and fish in the supermarkets, and it's needed 
uh, new scientific advances to go um, beyond what is the technology that we use right now uh, to get to these uh, hamburgers and to this um, uh, fibrous uh, meat based on soy that we see so far. So as you know, uh, as most of you know, the technology right now is based on um, either uh, having a composition that has a lot of info, a lot of uh, advances on uh, the taste, uh, on the texture, on the nutritional property. But when it comes to ground meat, either that, or you can work with uh, quite well with soy, with gluten, but you are limited to uh, wet or high moisture extrusion, and you can get quite well what is a chicken uh, strip, chicken chunk, or also, uh, for example, Good Catch is doing some uh, uh, nice uh, tuna uh, chunks. Uh, what I feel is that there is a need for a variety. What we see right now in supermarkets is a variety and, uh, and um, this will be what uh, we need to have to eat some parts of the meat industry, right? The meat industry is worth, uh, will be worth very soon, probably 1.4 trillion. Now it's worth around 1 trillion. And if we want to get, uh, you know, the alternative meat industry, the, the, we want to get to a percentage like 20, 30% of this trillion meat uh, uh, dollar uh, mm, trillion dollar meat market. We need to have a variety of uh, of products. Right, and and just in terms of your location, I, I believe you're based in Barcelona, and you you know for, for for now we see a lot of those products. You know, so so many of them in the United States of America, and you know, country that gave us Impossible Burger and beyond. Uh, meat um burger and so so I was just wondering how that you know you know how does europe i mean does Europe have actually chance to develop many more of the ingredients or if you have any take on on this region yeah, I think we are very lucky in Europe that we have always been uh, uh, focused on the nutritional and the quality of the pro the gastronomy that we have here, especially near Barcelona in our example in the Mediterranean area. I come from Italy, but our startup is uh, based in Barcelona. What we think is that the next uh, generation is not only a variety of meats, but going a little bit uh, uh, beyond the, uh, the mixture of canola, coconut oil, and have the, um, you know, the, the, the composition and nutritional values that are the ones that we can find right now in Impossible and uh, beyond. We want to have a variety, not only in the form of uh, uh, the texture and the type of uh, alternative meat that we want to eat, but also we can take advantage in uh, Europe uh, with our knowledge and great chefs and great restaurants and great uh, gastronomy tradition to use this, um, uh, to bring it to the market uh, some new products in terms of uh, very good nutritional quality. Uh, because we want to be associated, alternative meat, meat needs to be associated not only to environmental and to animal welfare uh, issues, to solve these issues, but uh, very important, we need to associate alternative meat to the health issue, especially if we want to uh, have an important part in Europe, we can focus on that. And then our product, uh, European-based products, can be exported very well in Asia. As you know, Asia, uh, Asian consumers are very, very uh, well, um, uh, they really care very much about the, the safety and the healthy uh, um, factor of the, of the product that we are bringing to market. So I think Europe is in a very good position and uh, Europe should invest more in the form of, you know, the European uh, uh, funds, et cetera, public funds, invest more in alternative meat, in, including including cell-based meat, not only plant-based meat, of course, and including fermented protein, which is something that, uh, as you know, for example, the Good Food Institute at the beginning was uh, plant-based and cell-based, now they incorporated fermented protein. So uh, this is moving, and uh, now we see that there is a variety of uh, of uh, products upcoming, but also a focus on nutritional and quality of uh, what is product. Great. Well, th thank you. And actually, uh, on the subject of uh, Europe, I have a question uh, to Stacy. Stacy, you, you did your PhD in, uh, at the University of Colorado. You've got um, research experience both in the U.S. and Europe. How do this, these two regions compare and what kind of edge could Europe gain uh, over America as far as scientific um, research technology that is concerned? Yeah, thank Agnieszka. That's a really great question. Um, yeah, so if you can tell, I'm American, but I've been living and working in Europe for about the past six years. Well, 
the UK, you know, has been Europe. We'll see about that. But um, uh, <laughs> so um, no, but I really see a huge potential for Europe to kind of almost become a, a new leader in this field, even though the US, I think, is really good at fundraising from venture capital to support alternative protein companies. But I think um, actually so far, um, Europe has been much better at cross-sector collaboration and supporting academic research. If you look at a lot of the companies that have started out that are really high profile, such as Mosa Meats and Aleph Farms in in uh, Israel, which is part of the EIT network, like they're quite closely associated and affiliated with research universities. And I think that lends a lot of strength. Um, and there's um, the Good Food Institute has been doing a really great job of lobbying in all regions, but especially the US and lately in Europe to get more government funding. But I think the fact that Europe is used to working in sort of these cross-sector collaborations is really a benefit that I think could propel the entire field of alternative proteins forward. Even though my perspective is largely focused on cultivated meat, I think that advances in plant-based proteins and also fermentation, synthetic biology can feed into cultivated meat and it can create this symbiotic network. Um, because obviously as well, if you look at the science and innovation that's needed, it's, there's still a long way to go to reach that holy grail product of like a truly structured piece of meat, like a steak. Uh, there's a lot of science that needs to go into creating these types of things. And I think that the best way to get there is by finding a way to work together uh, and rather than individual companies trying to tackle the entire sort of vertical scale of, uh, of technical issues, which is traditionally how it's been approached and largely been approached in the US. Mm -hmm. and, and are you seeing any um, increased interest from governments uh, in actually funding the space? I was just wondering whether uh, the European Union's um, sustainability agenda, for example, Farm to Fork, has somehow given that push for um, investing more in um, alternative proteins. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the idea. So the new Farm to Fork initiative was, again, pushed forward by uh, GFI Europe's team, which is really great. And so we're hoping that that will, again, like push more investment, especially in the governmental sector. But you also see for, you know, I'm located in Brussels, Belgium right now. And, um, you know, one of the great sort of success stories is the Flotour project, which is, uh, which is between a piece of meat and also local companies as well as academic institutes to solve a problem related to cultivated meat. So I think that model could also be quite appealing uh, to different countries to adopt. Mm -hmm. And a question to Tom, I mean, both Giuseppe and Stacy alluded to um, fermentation and, um, and, 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 and indeed there's been a lot of buzz about around uh, all sorts of microbes and microalgae and, and, and so on. And I, so I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, given your role at the GFI as well, um, I mean, are these, you know, what, what will they add to the industry in, in, in terms of the ingredients? What, what, what do they have to offer? And, you mean the, uh, for the fermentation side? Yeah, on, on the fermentation yeah. side, and I was just one, and I was also in general curious where you see those opportunities in um, in in the area of opportunities for further development of ingredients in order to further the the uh, yeah the development of the alternative protein industry. So I, I would uh, mention that one of the amazing things about uh, microbes is that their um, uh, lifetime is extremely short. So one of the things that I think is really incredible uh, is uh, developing uh, new crops for the plant-based meat industry. I think this is one of the most interesting uh, directions to develop the alternative proteins. However, the only thing that I think that could be more interesting than developing new crops might be to develop new strains of uh, um, uh, microorganisms that could be uh, developed to have uh, the, um, the molecules and the um, uh, molecular profiles that could be similar uh, to it, just because their uh, uh, life, lifetime is so short. So there are several uh, companies that try to go towards this direction. 
when we talk about fermentation, we talk about three di general uh, directions. One is the uh, traditional fermentations where we use the microorganism in order to as a processing aid. The second is precision fermentation that we see with perfect day impossible. And the third is for a uh, whole uh, for the biomass, just growing the uh, my, microorganism for the biomass. Things that are already being done for, in, with companies like uh, Quorn, and you just grow them and then you can eat them. But if we can first um, do some kind of directed evolution to make their composition more similar to meat, I think that's something that could be really big. Um, so that's uh, something really exciting. And I would mention that here in Israel, we also now hired a, an expert regarding fermentation. So if someone is interested, I'd be happy to connect uh, to her to maybe give uh, additional counsel. And, and just a question, do you, what, what sort of quality, obviously when we look at all sorts of alternative uh, meat products, a lot of them use soy, and it's been one of those magic ingredients, I guess, because it's easy to get hold of, it's relatively cheap. So I just wonder whether um, the fermentation can uh, compete with the ingredients such as soy or even peas, uh, when it comes to cost, um, is that easily scalable? That's an interesting question. I'm not, a, uh, the, the answer is that I don't really know because it really depends, I'm not an expert in the field. I would say that if you are going towards a precision fermentation, which is what most people talk about, things like impossible and a perfect day, uh, if you are going towards uh, generating a molecule that will be a very large portion of the final product, I think then you will have some issues with a, a good cost. However, if you are generating uh, things that you need in very small amounts, like uh, flavor, specific flavor molecules or enzymes, then you can uh, really, then you can tackle the cost in a fair uh, manner. So it really, when you go for fermentation, you really need to think about what is the specific and what is the specific advantage. But uh, there are advantages, specifically in terms of the fact that uh, of the um, nutritional value, can you, the, you can have the really high uh, concentrations of the right proteins, and you can really modify them in a very quickly, perhaps to generate those um, fatty acid compositions which are similar to those of animals. And try to do some kind of a, a, a evolutionary path towards that. And, uh, so I think that in those directions, you can uh, really get into something that is worthwhile in terms of uh, cost. However, as I said, I'm not from the industry, so I'm not from the industry, so I don't know the exact calculations of cost of the different uh, portions. Sure, sure. Um, and just wanted to hand over back to Ryan and Lawrence, just in terms of the timing, and if we have any questions from the audience. We can we Hello? continue. Hi, yes, we can continue for another five minutes or so. Uh, and yeah, a shout out to the audience if they have questions, please start uh, putting them in the chat. Um, but we're happy for you to continue the conversation. Sure, uh, I'll be very happy to. And I, and I, um, I guess one question I wanted to ask to to the the three of you, um, whoever wants to answer. I guess, given the pandemic, um, what sort of do you see already some sort of emphasis on certain um, aspects of your work that are coming? Um, um, you know, become more and more urgent, or do you see any increased inter interest in certain areas, or is that somehow having any any impact on the on the research um, research development at the moment? Um, I can take the beginning if you wish. Um, we think in uh, plant-based meat that there is a very big uh, the shift towards alternative uh, meat is accelerating. The shift towards a more resilient uh, system, as also yesterday Benjamina was explaining when uh, she pitched uh, higher stakes. Uh, we see that uh, the slaughterhouses, uh, closures, etc. Uh, what's, happening, what's happening in Europe? We don't want to be dependent on importing uh, too much uh, products, especially soy, for example, from outside, from uh, Brazil, from the States. We don't want to be 
under um, you know the need for import uh, importing because we are under fluctuations and when there is a pandemic you don't know what happens you need to be able yourself to produce and have your own uh, protein and your own uh, ingredients so what i feel is that uh, where we aim towards uh, a future uh, which is uh, sustainable in terms of a uh, better biodiversity in terms of the ingredients used ingredients used in a territory meat uh, if we are able to have a, a variety of uh, ingredients uh, this will support the countries that uh, rely on import import for example not only in Europe, also China was importing a lot and is importing a lot of soy from uh, and beef from um, uh, Brazil. And what happens is uh, that uh, they found vi virus. I don't know if you read about it. They found the virus in the frozen package of uh, meat from uh, Brazil. I think it was not beef, it was a chicken probably. But uh, what happened was uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the countries and the governments need to find a way to be independent and uh, auto sustainable without the need of importing too much, uh, which means that uh, this uh, goes, now we'll pass it to the cell, cell based experts here, but uh, I think in plant based uh, Europe, having a, a system that uh, is based on biodiversity, so avoiding single crops can be very useful. So instead of using only uh, soy, wheat, gluten, uh, yellow pea protein, we can really support other proteins that can be even uh, produced uh, in, uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And a question to um, Stacey or, or, or Tom in terms of um, scalability. Uh, what are the key challenges in achieving scale for uh, cell-based uh, meat? What do we have to overcome? Yeah, so Stacey, you want to take this? I was like, well, which one of us should go? Uh, um, I, yeah, I could all say a few points and then you can add to it, Tom. Um, for cultivated meat, I think the challenges largely remain the same. So like we saw some good presentations earlier that like from Cellular Revolution and Cell Ag Limited that were about the issue of basically scaling up cell mass, which I think a lot of cultivated meat companies are dealing with right now. Um, but really the technical challenges that need to be overcome are yeah, generating enough mass, but that's also really dependent on obviously culture medium, which is becoming quite a big thing as well. But um, also there's become more interest in scaffolding, which is really my expertise and thinking about how can you integrate these materials in different ways, maybe quite early on in the process as like micro carriers and things like that. Um, and think about materials that can be supportive to growing cells in a structured way, but also can be integrated into the final product. So um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges that still need to be overcome. And I bet Tom has a few more to add. Yeah, so I would say that for the scale up, uh, first of all, all of the fact when we try to use the fusion bioreactors, I guess that for the other technologies, we already know the proliferation bioreactors, Things like that, we already we know how to scale those up for the um, uh, perfusion bioreactors. When you try to grow a thick uh, tissue and you want to grow it in large uh, scales, uh, the bioreactors are all uh, are just in the, the beta phase or in the alpha phase. And if you want to increase them for 10,000 liters and you want to perfuse the media for the scaffold, I think that's something that would be a little bit. Uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know, the perfusion bioreactor is meant for the differentiation portion of uh, growing the cultivated meat. So if you want to culture the cells in a 3D environment, um, so we still need to develop a new um, bioreactors for that. Also uh, modules for uh, uh, recycling, uh, media recycling. Uh, that's something that uh, basically generating, I think something that could be extremely important for this industry is developing uh, sensors for growth factors that if they will be there, then we can really efficiently uh, uh, recycle the media much more efficiently. And I think that's something that is uh, really, uh, you have, we will have, the aid, we'll be, uh, we'll have to do that in order to uh, uh, generate the uh, cultivated meat efficiently. Basically, the um, uh, sensor for bioreactors is a really crucial for us. Okay, and if if we have a little bit more time, Stacey, what is your preferred method of scaffolding? I mean, there's all sorts of different technologies, and uh, Giuseppe, that 3D printing, there's mycelium. I just wonder whether you have an a, 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 an ingredient that can work, in your view. 
In my view, actually, I think, so I, I come from the world that's mostly about hydrogel, so that's my personal bias, but, um, mm. but, but the more that I've been looking into it, um, I think that there's room for lots of different solutions to this. And again, I think it's because uh, something Giuseppe mentioned earlier, there's going to be such a variety of different types of products. And so, for example, the types of cells that people are using to actually make the meat is so different from like, you know, embryonic pluripotent stem cells versus satellite cells uh, that are isolated directly. Those all have really different requirements for like whether they want to be attached to a surface and if so, how. Um, and then also again, for the different type of end product you wanna make, depending on the tissue type and the cut, uh, you're gonna have a lot of different sort of solutions. So, you know, things like the nanofiber scaffolds could be good for more fibrous things or thin products like jerky and stuff. Hydrogels are great. That's being used by most of meats to generate the individual muscle fibers. It provides a good environment for cells to interact together in a natural way. Porous scaffolds are being used by olive farms, which are, are nice for sort of growing something more three-dimensional that could still be perfused or have culture medium going through. And so I really think that there's not going to be one single answer of this is the right way to do it. But I think we're going to see a lot of different materials for a lot of different applications, which is exciting because it means scientifically there's a lot of different areas to be explored and it's not a race to, to the finish. And it's just, it's, there's going to be such a diversity. Right. Interesting. So it's a very tailored approach that um, needs to be taken. Um, and just a very last question. I'm worried that um, I'm aware that we, we don't have much time. So, uh, question to each of you, and you have a very, you know, five seconds to answer. I just wanted to know in how many years are we going to see a plant based steak or a cell based steak uh, competing? With real meat at super on supermarket shelves, over you know, and having a a, a good price, uh, you know, um, being able to actually beat beat the the, the real thing. Um, um, I guess Stacy and, and and Tom, you can answer on cell based, and Giuseppe on plant based, if you want. Yeah, I can start with the plant based. I can say uh, Nova Meat, but also other competitors of us or friends of us that working with the steak and other whole all muscle cats. Aiming for 2021-22. In our case, in Nova Meat, we can say that uh, we think 2022-2023 in the supermarket, but already being able to test our or other products uh, similar to ours in restaurants already next year, 2021. And regarding cell base, let me just uh, provoke it. I think uh, cell base will be not in Europe at the beginning. It will be in Singapore, and it will be maybe uh, seven years from now, and it will be not. A muscle, complete muscle, it will be an hybrid format with some cells, just uh, some functionality, with by some uh, adipose cells plus a scaffold that is composed uh, or created by a company like Noamid creating the scaffold, for example. Mm -hmm. Stacy? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that in a way, actually, um, that Giuseppe is saying that the first product that will come out that's a cell-based steak will definitely be a hybrid, which again is the approach a lot of different companies are taking. So I think for a hybrid steak, something that resembles it, uh, I don't know, I'm more like maybe 10 years. Again, I come from a scientific background. Things take longer than you think they will, but you always have to be optimistic. I think for something that's truly cell-based, that, that replicates the biology, the structure as precisely as possible, I think we're looking at a couple of decades definitely so mm. like I see this but I but again that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing because there's going to be such a range of different sort of stepwise products that come out in different types in the meantime so what's exciting is that I think in our lifetime hopefully we'll see it and that's the focus of our careers really is supporting that mm -hmm. Tom so I'm not a prophet I'm a scientist so I my answer is that I don't know However, I know that some companies talk about, uh, first of all, I, I agree with the hybrid products. Basically, if we can just generate a, like a 95% uh, plant-based or 50% plant-based and just add, or mo mostly 95% plant-based and add the essential thing that is missing in the, in the plant-based meat, which is mostly the fat uh, side, uh, I think that's something that could be feasible in the short term. Some companies talk about next year, uh, I hope that they are uh, correct and we will just wait and see because I hear uh, all of these estimates all the time and I, I just don't, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not the problem. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you so much to, to, to all of you for, for answering all the questions um, and great to, great to be with you.
Thank you. Thank you so thanks. much for inviting us. Yeah, thanks for moderating, yeah, and thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting us to speak. It's a pleasure. Thank everybody. Um, some great insights there. And uh, I think the message that we want to share before we're going to do some networking is that, um, yeah, we're going to do some networking so uh, you can connect. Um, I'll quickly share my screen um, here. It allows me. There we go.